Perhaps our greatest distinction as a species is our capacity, unique among animals, to make counter-evolutionary choices. History followed different courses for different peoples because of differences among people's environments, not because of biological differences among peoples themselves. Europe's colonization of Africa had nothing to do with differences between European and African peoples themselves, as white racists assume. Rather, it was due to accidents of geography and biogeography, in particular, to the continent's different areas, axes, and suites of wild plant and animal species. That is, the different historical trajectories of Africa and Europe stem ultimately from differences in real estate. Much of human history has consisted of unequal conflicts between the haves and the have-nots. The values to which people cling most stubbornly under inappropriate conditions are those values that were previously the source of their greatest triumphs. In much of the rest of the world, rich people live in gated communities and drink bottled water. That's increasingly the case in Los Angeles where I come from. So that wealthy people in much of the world are insulated from the consequences of their actions. What makes patriotic and religious fanatics such dangerous opponents is not the deaths of the fanatics themselves but their willingness to accept the deaths of a fraction of their number in order to annihilate or crush their infidel enemy. With the rise of chiefdoms around 7,500 years ago, people had to learn, for the first time in history, how to encounter strangers regularly without attempting to kill them. The metaphor is so obvious. Easter Island isolated in the Pacific Ocean, once the island got into trouble, there was no way they could get free. There was no other people from whom they could get help. In the same way that we on planet Earth, if we ruin our own, world, we won't be able to get help. Isn't language loss a good thing? Because fewer languages mean easier communication among the world's people? perhaps, but it's a bad thing in other respects. Languages differ in structure and vocabulary, in how they express causation and feelings and personal responsibility, hence in how they shape our thoughts. There's no single purpose best language. Instead, different languages are better suited for different purposes. For instance, it may not have been an accident that Plato and Aristotle wrote in Greek, while Kant wrote in German. The grammatical particles of those two languages, plus their ease in forming compound words, may have helped make them the preeminent languages of Western philosophy. Another example, familiar to all of us who studied Latin, is that highly inflected languages, ones in which word endings suffice to indicate sentence structure, can use variations of word order to convey nuances impossible with English. Our English word order is severely constrained by having to serve as the main clue to sentence structure. If English becomes a world language, that won't be because English was necessarily the best language for diplomacy. Science is often misrepresented as, the body of knowledge acquired by performing replicated controlled experiments in the laboratory. Actually, science is something broader. The acquisition of reliable knowledge about the world. Two types of choices seem to me to have been crucial in tipping the outcomes, of the various societies' histories, towards success or failure long-term planning and willingness to reconsider core values. 
On reflection we can also recognize the crucial role of these same two choices for the outcomes of our individual lives. People often ask, what is the single most important environmental population problem facing the world today? A flip answer would be, the single most important problem is our misguided focus on identifying the single most important problem. 12,000 years ago, everybody on earth was a hunter-gatherer. Now almost all of us are farmers or else are fed by farmers. The spread of farming from those few sites of origin usually did not occur as a result of the hunter-gatherers elsewhere adopting farming. Hunter-gatherers tend to be conservative. Instead, farming spread mainly through farmers outbreeding hunters, developing more potent technology. And then killing the hunters or driving them off of all lands suitable for agriculture. History as well as life itself is complicated. Neither life nor history is an enterprise for those who seek simplicity and consistency. My two main conclusions are that technology develops cumulatively, rather than in isolated heroic acts, and that it finds most of its uses after it has been invented, rather than being invented to meet a foreseen need. It's striking that Native Americans evolved no devastating epidemic diseases to give to Europeans in return for the many devastating epidemic diseases that Indians received from the Old World. To me, the conclusion that the public has the ultimate responsibility for the behavior of even the biggest businesses is empowering and hopeful, rather than disappointing. My conclusion is not a moralistic one about who is right or wrong, admirable or selfish, a good guy or a bad guy. My conclusion is instead a prediction, based on what I have seen happening in the past. Businesses have changed when the public came to expect and require different behavior, to reward businesses for behavior that the public wanted and to make things difficult for businesses practicing behaviors that the public didn't want. I predict that in the future, just as in the past, changes in public attitudes will be essential for changes in businesses' environmental practices. We know from our recent history that English did not come to replace U.S. Indian languages merely because English sounded musical to Indians' ears. Instead, the replacement entailed English-speaking immigrants killing most Indians by war, murder, and introduced diseases. And the surviving Indians being pressured into adopting English, the new majority language. Not until the beginning of the 20th century did Europe's urban populations finally become self-sustaining. Before then, constant immigration of healthy peasants from the countryside was necessary to make up for the constant deaths of city dwellers from crowd diseases. Rhino-mounted Bantu shock troops could have overthrown the Roman Empire. It never happened. Above all, it seems to me wrong-headed and dangerous to invoke historical assumptions about environmental practices of native peoples in order to justify treating them fairly. By invoking this assumption, i.e., that they were, are better environmental stewards than other peoples or parts of contemporary society, to justify fair treatment of native peoples. We imply that it would be okay to mistreat them if that assumption could be refuted. In fact, the case against mistreating them isn't based on any historical assumption about their environmental practices. It's based on a moral principle, namely, that it is morally wrong for one people to dispossess, subjugate or exterminate another people. 
The history of interactions among disparate peoples is what shaped the modern world through conquest. Epidemics and genocide. Those collisions created reverberations that have still not died down after many centuries, and that are actively continuing in some of the world's most troubled areas. All human societies contain inventive people. It's just that some environments provide more starting materials and more favorable conditions for utilizing inventions than do other environments. Globalization makes it impossible for modern societies to collapse in isolation, as did Easter Island and the Greenland Norse in the past. Any society in turmoil today, no matter how remote, can cause trouble for prosperous societies on other continents and is also subject to their influence, whether helpful or destabilizing. For the first time in history, we face the risk of a global decline, but we also are the first to enjoy the opportunity of learning quickly from developments in societies anywhere else in the world today. And from what has unfolded in societies at any time in the past. That's why I wrote this book. It seems logical to suppose that history's pattern reflects innate differences among people themselves. Of course, we're taught that it's not polite to say so in public. We see in our daily lives that some of the conquered peoples continue to form an underclass. Centuries after the conquests or slave imports took place. We're told that this too is to be attributed not to any biological shortcomings but to social disadvantages and limited opportunities. Nevertheless, we have to wonder. We keep seeing all those glaring, persistent differences in people's status. We're assured that the seemingly transparent biological explanation for the world's inequalities as of AD 1500 is wrong, but we're not told what the correct explanation is. Until we have some convincing, detailed, agreed-upon explanation for the broad pattern of history, most people will continue to suspect that the racist biological explanation is correct after all. That seems to me the strongest argument for writing this book. Besides justifying the transfer of wealth to kleptocrats, institutionalized religion brings two other important benefits to centralized societies. First, Shared ideology or religion helps solve the problem of how unrelated individuals are to live together without killing each other, by providing them with a bond not based on kinship. Second, it gives people a motive, other than genetic self-interest, for sacrificing their lives on behalf of others.